I'm Alana. I have they, she pronouns. And I'm Jesse. I use she, her pronouns. And, and we're, we're making menches. <laughs> <laughs> we get closer every uh, week. Yeah. Making Menches is an organization providing radical Jewish education. And this is the artist series where we showcase queer Jewish anti-Zionist artists. And today we're talking to Aviva. So Aviva, introduce yourself, name, pronouns, where you call home, astrological sign if you're into that because we are. And then tell us what kind of art you make. Yeah, totally. My name is Aviva Oscow, but my artist name and what my name on Instagram is, Aviva Laviv. And I use they or she pronouns. And I live in Brooklyn in the process of moving, which is why I'm a little sweaty right now, actually, because I was like literally moving stuff right before this. And I'm a Gemini, so Gemini season. Actually, I think it just turned to Cancer Ooh. season, which has been the craziest time ever because the majority of my very closest dear friends here are also Gemini. It's like, little Gemini pod so it's been incredibly <laughs> fun and also very busy and it's been pride so it's been like honestly it's been the most Gemini month possible I think but I am a musician I'm a singer songwriter and I have a band as well sometimes I perform solo sometimes I play with my band and I'm also a visual and product designer and I work for the federal government actually using design to make government services and experiences easier to interact with and better access for the public. So I think I'm on here more from my art life, but my work life is also my art life, but in a different context. And I, for the majority of my career, have actually been super focused on my design career. And it's only been in the past few years that I really put a lot into my music. I talk more about my music like on my social media and stuff. So if anyone's linking to there from this, you won't really see that much about my civic design stuff, but that's also a big part of my artistic life. Yeah, that's a little background on me. I, I feel like I found that out about you recently at Pride because you were like, I designed that shirt. And I was like, oh, that's incredible. So yeah, truly, I didn't even realize how far your artistry expanded. And I'm excited to hear maybe how that comes into play in some of our later questions. We just wanted to start with like generally, what is your relationship to Judaism right now, yeah. historically? I feel very Jewish. <laughs> I feel like being Jewish is a huge part of my identity. I grew up in a really, I would call like an ethnic enclave in the Minneapolis, Minnesota area. It's funny because when I talk to non-Jewish friends or partners or people, and I explained what my upbringing is, I realized how Jewish it was. <laughs> Cause I'm just like, oh, that was normal. But especially like bringing my non-Jewish partners home, I'm always like, oh wow, this is, I'm exposing you to how, how much Judaism actually affects so many levels of my life growing up. But I grew up in a conservative, at a conservative synagogue, it was egalitarian, but definitely in the kind of in-between in terms of, we had modern Orthodox people at our school and also reform. And then we were like in the middle. And my mom and my aunt both were teachers at the Jewish day school that I went to. I went to a Jewish school until I was in high school. And then even then there was a significant amount of Jews at our public school. We are called the Jew crew. <laughs> I'm still actually like close with Why is cute. like every young Jewish person who grew up with other Jewish people had a Jew crew? Because I feel like I had the exact same thing <laughs> with people in my Torah school. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, it's funny because I don't even think we let, we knew, we never called ourselves that because it was just us for so long. And then we got to high school. I feel like maybe some people have a different experience, but we actually had a lot of fun in high school because our high school was pretty diverse, but very, they, a lot of those kids had gone to the same couple public schools for their whole growing up. And so when we came in, it was like a whole group of new kids that they'd never met. And they all called us the Jew group, but not the derogatory way. It was more of a, that's a cool new group of kids that we want to know, which I think is actually a really sweet experience versus people being like shitty towards a group of Jewish students. But yeah, I could like list so all of the ways that my life was so Jewish. But yeah, now I would say that my Judaism really takes, I feel very deep into my cultural and 
heritage aspect of Judaism and finding new ways to really connect with the spiritual aspects. I definitely don't identify with the conservative movement anymore, but although I did get a really sweet email from the rabbi from my I want to do a really quick shout out to the new head rabbi at the synagogue that I grew up at, is Adathi Sharon in, in, in Minnesota, and the new rabbi is the first gay rabbi of a major conservative synagogue in the United States. My mom sent him my music video that just dropped last week, Fantasy, and he sent me an email. I don't even know him very well. He wasn't the rabbi when I was like still living there, but he sent me an email and was like, call a kavod on this music video, it really shares our values, and it's so great to see, and I was like, <laughs> I actually showed Alana on Pride, because I had just gotten the email, and I was like, this is so cute. Best um, possible Pride email, Pride Judaism confluence ever, I love that. It really was, I was like, wow, this is sweet, and he's really, I think, I don't think that we agree on everything, but I think he's really trying to take that synagogue in a progressive direction. It's like steps, I think, in so many areas, we need to just, like, see where we're able to take steps forward, and it's hard. But yeah, I, uh, the things that I try to do the most now, I really try to make space for Jewish ritual. I don't do Shabbat every week, but that's something I would love to do more. I've been hosting bigger seders that are often probably more non-Jews than Jews and doing stuff for Rosh Hashanah, some of the just different holidays. And my friend group is very diverse. There's not a lot of other Jews in it, but it's very diverse in terms of nationality and religion and where folks are from and there's a lot of cultural sharing in the friend group which is really sweet and that's been one of my major ways of connecting myself is getting to find ways to distill what I think is really beautiful or special about Judaism and then share that with other people so that's been cool. I think that's great and I think you already started to direct us to the next question when you brought up your music video because our next question was going to be how do your identities impact or show up in your art? So yeah. some identities uh, like Jewishness, anti-Zionism, queerness, all the above. Yeah, definitely. I think it influences, it influences my art even more than I realize. A lot of times when people ask me what my musical style is, or if they've heard some of my music, or they hear me perform and they don't know that much about me, they're often like, what is your background or what's your ethnicity? because the way that I end up singing and the melodies often brings in this kind of, there's something there that definitely is coming from the Jewish songs that I, you know, grew up singing and the prayers and the certain, I would say it's like a combination of music from the Levant and also like Ashkenazi kind of Eastern European Jewish influences, whether or not I'm singing about anything Jewish, but that definitely is there. Sometimes I get thrown into a global music category, which I don't, I hate that actually. I hate the term global music because it's literally just any music that's not directly from like the UK or the US. Literally. <laughs> like the rest of the world. But that is true. There's some other things going on there. But then I do have some specific, a lot of my music is, I would say, social conscious music. Like that's my background is writing folk music that's very political, addressing a lot of social issues. And while I don't always speak specifically to Jewish issues in that, my Jewish upbringing and the community that I was in really influenced my desire for social justice. So that's really, that's been a core of my whole life so that just ends up being what I often write about and to connect with other people in my art not all of my songs are like that a lot of them are also about emotions mental health relationships kind of stuff like that but it usually takes this introspective or worldview that I feel like is really influenced by the Jewish values that I was raised with and then I do have one song that I put out recently I just have I have two versions of it actually called Fega Etka which is it's a immigration rights song, but it's a dual narrative of my family's journey coming to the United States and fleeing persecution in Russia during the pogroms against Jews and coming to the United States and being able to seek refuge here. And it's paralleled with a story of a family coming from Honduras in more modern day. And I sing in Yiddish in that, I sing in Yiddish and Spanish and English in that one. And so through that song specifically, I've really got to connect with my family in this really beautiful way. And that's the most overtly, at least in the music that I've released, the most overtly Jewish one. But I also love singing Jewish songs and I sometimes do that at performances. I might bring something in depending on the setting. 
So yeah, I feel like it's, it affects me in that way. My activism definitely comes through in my music, even if I'm not necessarily speaking to Jewish issues, I guess I would say. And it's cute because the rabbi that emailed me was like, you're really promoting our values, which I think what he was speaking to is that in that song Fantasy, I, in the chorus, I say something about, it's not your job to fix it all, but altogether less likely to fall. And there's the Jewish proverb around, it's not your job to finish it, but it's also your duty to not put it down yeah. or not leave it, which yeah. I'm not saying exactly correctly, but I think you know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. You're not, what is it? You're not free to desist from it. Jesse knows the full thing for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You're not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to desist from it. Yes. You're okay with both for the classics. Yeah, that was in our, in my school growing up, we had these different values like that up on the walls. And I remember that one and just generally like tikkun olam, repairing the world. Yeah. Also my aunt, all of my family are all artists in some ways, but my aunt was the art teacher at my Jewish day school and she's still, she's an artist and her art is all very Judaic and she brings in a lot of prayer mm -hmm. through art in this really beautiful way. And she's also in this really cool interfaith artist group in Minneapolis and it has all these different Ooh. women art. Yeah, it's cool. They, when they've done these shows together and they all bring in their connection to spirituality and their heritage and culture through their art. And it's like really, it's very pretty. It's really cool. I love that. Yeah. What was in it like singing in Yiddish? Do you have a background in Yiddish prior to that? Or did you have to learn for the song? Yeah, I think I'm like a lot of probably Jews our age that know a lot of Jewish phrases. Like I'm always the person that, oh, did you know that's a, like people are using Yiddish in mm -hmm. regular language. And my family definitely uses a lot of Yiddish phrasing. My, but I don't speak it. I didn't grow up speaking it. My grandmother understands it because her, her parents are, her, it was her parents' first language when they spoke it at home, but she was of the generation that was really taught to assimilate. So I had to learn I had to learn it. I only say it for a short line. And in the recent version that I released, which is a, the original version, which is on my EP from this past year, Vigilant Love Volume 1, is a, I like to, my producer and I, and my, he's in my band, Misha Savage, we call it Shtetl, Shtetl Rock, because <laughs> it's like klezmer but it's also definitely indie rock. And in that version, it's like a lot bigger, but I also released an acoustic version this spring with this really amazing klezmer cellist, Rafi Bowden. And he is very involved in the klezmer world in New York and elsewhere. He, I, I keep meeting all these klezmer artists all over that they all know each other. It's definitely a strong community that I'm not really a part of, but I've gotten to meet a lot of folks through trying to find the right people to collaborate on that song with. In the recording, it's a violinist, Eli Wirtschafter, who I grew up with in Minneapolis, actually. So when I was working with Rafi, he was like, we were talking about the pronunciation and I was like, I think my pronunciation is not that good, actually. But at the time, I wasn't really involved with folks that I think could, whenever I try to do anything, like I have a few songs where I use Spanish really, like specifically. And for those, I was collaborating with folks that speak Spanish and that is part of their culture. And so I did a lot to make sure that I was using the pronunciation correctly and really honoring, honoring the language. And I think I tried to do that with Yiddish, but I probably did it better with Spanish than I did with Yiddish. I feel like my anti-Zionism, I feel like is really connected to resurgence of Yiddish and Ashkenazi culture, not in like a Ashkenazi dominant to Mizrahi or any other Sephardic, any other Jewish ethnicity, because that's already a really common thing, but more like as American Jews and Israelis, we have both, I think, been forced to assimilate to being American or being wherever you ended up and release a lot of that. And because of Zionism and the desire to really have everyone be pushed towards Israel, we all were taught to put down our, and not even taught, actively told to put down some of these really specific and cool histories that we have to focus on Zionism. And there's such a rich history in Yiddish music and theater and activism. And I've been trying to reconnect more with that because especially in, in the left space, there's just, there's just such a rich history there. Every, every time I 
that dip my toes into that, it gets me really excited because it feels much more close to my personal history and my personal lineage, at least in recent memory. I want to get into it more, but it's, I'm like a little like baby, I'm like a little baby klezmer <laughs> Yiddish person. I did get to play, I did get to play a little bit when in this new version we do, it's called a doina, which is a improvised klezmer piece moment. I don't know, they can go for a long time or short time. I think in the song I released, it's like a minute. So Rafi is doing this gorgeous improvisation on cello. And then he told me generally what notes I should be accompanying behind him on guitar. And I was so pumped when I was doing that. I was like, oh my God, I'm playing cluster music in the most baby way possible. But it's really cool. That's so exciting though. I love that. And that does feel like, I don't know, I think it's, it's such a good point to acknowledge that part of promoting Zionism was distancing Jews from their actual lineage and just connecting home and a home place to Israel instead of maybe what actual home looked like or talking about how home can be where we are as a Jewish community. So I can't talked about that before. I love that concept. And just, yeah, I think it's important and it's beautiful that you're starting to be able to reconnect with maybe your actual lineage distanced from Israel and the concept of Zionism. I recently was in a Jewish, it was like an intergenerational Jewish queer storytelling collective that was really beautiful. It was through the Generations Project, which they do these oral story storytelling for all different kinds of queer community, but they've also done some specific ethnic or cultural like specific groups. So I was in the Jewish one recently and did, that was my first time really doing a oral storytelling piece. And in that and through my art, I feel like I think a lot about trying to have, have compassion for my family and my ancestors and the things that they experience and try to understand why they made the choice that they made, whether or not I agree with them now. And I think that just speaking to the anti-Zionism and, and the concept of home, they never felt at home where they were. They were in Russia and they were fighting persecution for hundreds of years, if they were even. They were in the Pale of Settlement and before that, I'm not exactly sure where they were. But I think the Jews have this really beautiful way of creating community and sticking together in this really powerful way where home isn't necessarily tied to a place but it's tied to each other. And we have been this roaming diasporic people for so long that being tied to a place isn't the thing that keeps Judaism alive. And at the same time, I can understand why there was such a push towards wanting to have a place because I think this is part of where my anti-Zionism comes with compassion because I think that when we approach it by trying to act like people weren't also experiencing their own trauma in the moment or trauma begets trauma or that people didn't have a reason to want to be someplace safe. They're not talking about acknowledging that to get their safety, they're putting other people not in safety. But I gotta hold both of those things where I'm like, I get all, I get why even the assimilation that my, that all of our parents or grandparents or great grandparents did because that was what kept them safe or trying to attain safety for themselves after so long of not having it. So I feel like while well, now I can really be like, I don't agree with that. And I feel like we need to take this, we need to really be coming to terms with what does this mean for us now? I also see such a quick reaction, especially with people that maybe aren't investigating that history very much to be really, I don't know the right way to put it is exactly because I don't like the narrative I don't really like the narrative of well, there's two sides every, I mean that's that's true and I don't I feel like people use that in a way to downplay how horrific things that Israel does are and I don't want it to be like that but more like the people don't necessarily take time to be considering the nuance of just humanity in general where it's like the things that push people to do things like where is that coming from it's like a trying to understand a more holistic reasoning for why people do terrible things across the board i think that's important i think that's something that we've touched on a few times recently just around holding sympathy for jewish people who are maybe not at 
an anti-Zionist point in their Judaism because of being able to understand what that's grounded in. And the fact that a desire for the home is a valid and real desire, it's just like in this situation, it is coming at the expense of human life, which is where it goes wrong. And I also think it's important for us to remember we're actively colonizers on land that is not ours as well, living in America on Turtle Island. We are unfortunately active participants in colonization like anyone who's not on land that is native to them is and I don't know someone called me in on that recently and I was like that's yeah you're right and that's something that I think we we also need to keep in mind I think something that I was picking up on when you were talking is like (sighs) this connection to our elders, our Jewish elders, and maybe what their feelings on Zionism are or were and how to mitigate that, like their feelings on what home is to them. And I'm curious how you think art can help us communicate with our elders, older generations of Jewish people. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's so hard to know like exactly what people were feeling in the past, unless you have good Records, (laughs) which my family on my mom's side at least do to an extent. There's a lot of letter writing that is we still have, although a lot of it, the majority of it, is in Yiddish. And my cousin, who I like, want to touch on actually in a minute, has done some translation of. So I feel like we have some window into it. But I do feel like the things that I feel like it's so difficult because it's we're all human beings experiencing the same emotions no matter what era we're in but the things that we're dealing with and our knowledge around things can be just so different so this comes up a lot in the storytelling that i did around my queerness because i'm the first out queer woman or person assigned female at birth in my family and i'm the first person to break this tradition of marrying a man marrying a jewish man specifically and In that piece, I talk about my baby naming, which I'm named after several of my ancestors who my mom wrote this poem that like details all the things that she hopes that I'm like in these ways, which is really sweet and beautiful. That's That's so beautiful. (laughs) I actually read a portion of it at the beginning of this storytelling piece, but at the end of it, I come back to this thing where, because I go on this arc where I'm talking about, she, they wanted me to be this way. And one of the things that she said is to bring your uniqueness, to be all these things, but also to bring your uniqueness and light a torch into the future, essentially. And then I go through this whole thing where I'm like, I think I'm more unique than they are hoping for. I definitely have deviated in certain ways. But at the end, I come back around to, I think that if they could see me now, they would be proud. And like the flaming queer that I am. And... I always cry when I get to that point. I think the values that they, at least in my family, and I feel like for a lot of people, the values, whether, depending, even if we're not applying it to the same things that they were paying attention to necessarily, I feel like the values that we're taking with us around community and keeping tradition alive, I understand the insularity, even if I don't agree with it, because that's what has kept traditions alive. But like, how can we take those traditions and make them like current as well and I think that creating like doing that storytelling collective for example was like so powerful for me to get to be with a cohort of other Jews that was really it was very intergenerational it was like 20s up to 60s and 70s and so first of all that already feels like you're getting to create art with almost sisters elders at least but through that getting to really think about my art and create a piece of art where I'm really calling them in was the first time that I fully got to do that besides this song that I worked on but for me when I sing when I'm singing in Hebrew or in Yiddish singing prayers when I'm singing collectively with other Jews especially I feel this like thing rise inside me that is feels so ancient and so powerful and feels so unlike any other thing and I think this is true for all humans when we sing together it's this very powerful thing that happens. It it is very ancient, the singing around the fire all over the world. And so for me, creating art in those ways where I am, whether actively thinking about my ancestors or feeling connected to this source, it's just, it has brought me 
and especially thinking about wanting to have my own kids, which is something I've gone back and forth on a lot, but I'm back at a place of wanting to do that. I feel like it's so important and I feel really grateful also. I feel really grateful to come from such a rich history that has, that I have so much to draw upon. I think that is something that not everybody has and we're being called to call upon in a anti-colonial way. That's the main thing is that we're supposed to deconstruct white supremacy, where your actual roots from, what can you actually connect to, what is, and not everyone can even get that far. Not everyone, not everyone even feels connected enough. They might be so mixed together that they're like, I don't feel like I can claim anything, but I feel very lucky to have such a clear and connected line, not that you have to have that and it definitely doesn't have to be like you had to be Jewish on both of your sides forever. I just happened to be 100% Ashkenazi. I did something in me and it was like, I was like, maybe something else will be thrown in there. And it was like, nah, bitch, you're just, you're so Jewish. You're just so Jewish. It feels important to me and also challenging at times. Like the pressure of being the current end of the line of this lineage of survival and the pressure to continue that the pressure to continue it in a certain way is very strong. I think people don't, for any non-Jews that listen to this, I think people don't recognize the pressure of growing up and being essentially taught, not even essentially, fully told that the continuation of our people and repopulating after genocide relies on you having kids. <laughs> Which is a lot of pressure, but also I understand why the pressure is there. It's both, both and. I there's so much that you've just brought, weaved into this conversation of elders and our past and generations. And I think you're already touching on it too when you're talking about the power, the feeling that you get from singing with other Jews and just other people in general and how that as itself can be an act of reclaiming or an act of kind of repurposing of tradition. And I just wanted to point out part of your manifesto on your website and this seemed to strongly speak to the question about Jewish tradition and what a Jewish future looks like but I want to tie it to something else so let me read it to you even though you wrote it I compose to remember my tradition and to break from it and I think that's so beautiful that they're paired in the same sentence and I'm curious how you feel this speaks to Judaism in general or art as resistance in general yeah I mean it's, I like feel like when this storytelling thing goes live because it was recorded, I'll definitely send it to you because I feel like I spent so much time thinking about that very specific question of what am I bringing with me? What am I breaking? How can I con continue? I'm speaking specifically about the really strong matriarchy in my family and how can I continue that and also turn it into my own, taking it even away from the gender binary or yeah, so I think that like what I came to through that and like through my art in general and through recent things with my family too around acceptance, which has been challenging at times. My parents have always been like really accepting, but not everyone in my family has always been as accepting of like my identity, not necessarily like cruel to my face, but just, yeah, especially recently it's, it's been because I live more openly as a queer person now it, it does come up more so I, I think that where I'm trying to get to is just all of our ancestral stories and all of the things that we're like coming from none of them are 100% pure in anything like the lessons we need to take what we connect with with us and try to leave behind the things that we don't and the things that have caused us intergenerational trauma and the ways that we continue to try to control people that we love, which then, you know, just continues to cause these issues. How can we release those and still love people? How can we release with love? How can we acknowledge pain and acknowledge that everyone is human? And in most cases, in my life at least, the pain isn't intentional. But then also, where are those boundaries? If someone has really hurt you or you feel like your ancestral line is very damaged. You should be able to release that. You don't owe anyone. And I, I think that Jewish guilt is such an intense thing. I feel, I know that a lot of us, and it's what I was just speaking to about needing to, the pressure of having to like repopulate after the Holocaust, this sense of what your duty is so strong 
which I just, at this point, I can't separate those things from myself. I can't separate my desire to make change in the world and the work that I do professionally and personally and my desire for justice. I actually can't separate that from the kind of expectations that have been put on me and through my family and our community, even though it can like veer into the negative. But I think that like, I don't know, I think being able to explore those things in a really deep and artistic way recently has brought me so much more calm with it. I feel like I was feeling a lot of angst in the past few years around needing to push really far away and then trying to find this balance, especially when it comes to when it comes to speaking out against Israel. That specifically is such a challenging thing to have conversations with family around and can cause so much additional pain and, and other, th other political things, other things around identity and stuff as well. But I th think, I feel like in a lot of community and activist spaces, like we are, I think this, this pendulum swing of recognizing and, and coming to realization about certain things and then wanting to push really far away from them and then needing to find the balance between how do you stay in community so that we can continue to learn from each other. Because every time I go home and I'm speaking with my family, we'll have these tough conversations. And usually, whatever the topic is, they come away with a different understanding that they might not have had before or like connection to something that they didn't have connection to. And I see, I can actively see the way that changes their opinion about various things. And then they start to do learning on their own. And then not everyone is like that. And it's definitely a slow process. But if we were to like completely break all of those bonds, Speaking of like duty, I feel like part it's our duty to have the teaching comes down the line and the teaching also needs to go back up the line if they're, if they're willing to listen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If they're willing to listen is huge. I, you were saying that and I was like, honestly, incredible that you feel like they're getting something out of the conversations and actually internalizing it. I think even in that bars on the floor, but yeah, to them for that. That's awesome. I do feel like that's so often not the case, but I do think yeah, I feel I think a lot about what is our responsibility to try to educate our elders, like our immediate elders, and what is our, yeah, what's our responsibility to try to bring them into the fold. I was having that conversation with my brother actually recently, I don't know if he's still watching, but this conversation around when feeling like people have gone too far in a certain way, that it becomes mm -hmm. alienating, and I always come Come back to this like thing where we need people to be radical past the point of where we all are individually comfortable because that's what pushes the needle even if it's wow that was way too much or that action or that stance is really out there we need people that are doing that to point us in a direction and even if your personal stance doesn't get there and not even saying that everyone's farthest per personal stance is the correct place to be. But if everyone was just moderate, if everyone was just in the middle, if everyone was just like nice and centrist about things, nothing would ever change, nothing would ever get done. And the fact that it's like making us uncomfortable or making you uncomfortable is making you think. And that's a part of the whole point. So we need, need that. And then we need the people that can be the in-between. And I think that's how change has like always, has always occurred. There's always been this like pendulum. There's always been the spectrum and yeah, like we need that. And I think there's just this like giant reckoning happening right now in our community and all over the world. And it's really uncomfortable, <laughs> but that's yeah. important. Just thinking about the teaching the elders. I wanted to mention this before, but my, I feel like I'm like plugging a lot of things, but that's just cause there's a lot of cool things. But, we um... love a plug. We love a plug. <laughs> So my, my cousin, Rebecca Claren, is an author and she's a investigative journalist originally, but she is, she's published one book and she's, and this new book that she wrote is coming out in October under Penguin. And it is, the, I think the title now it used to be An American Inheritance, but the title now is The Cost of Free Land. And it specifically explores how our family was able to flee persecution in Russia for being Jewish, come to the United States and then benefit from the Homestead Act, which was actively genociding, enacting genocide on the Lakota, where our family ended up moving to, which is South Dakota. And it's this really just intense and beautiful and like 
just very deep exploration of a lot of the stuff that I'm speaking on as well of this like understanding of pain on multi from multiple places, but also needing to reckon with reality and history. And a lot of her investigative journalism has been on different native issues. And she has done a lot of work on various reservations in the past, which is what influenced creating this in the first place. So she really wrote it with she part of the journey, the investigative journey of the book, which I was able to participate with her part of was going to various Lakota land and we went to Standing Rock, Rosebud. There's, a, I think that there's four major reservations still in South Dakota and trying to find the families of the exact place where we would have been and where our land was, our land that we were like occupying and creating this both like his joint history of what was happening at that time and really reckoning with what was happening to the Native Americans because even our family that had we have these like photos from the early 1900s of our family with Lakota people and trying to even understand what the history there is but understanding what was really going on and, and then where are the, those descendants now and how we have been able to climb into economic stability into education into all these things and that has not been true for the majority of the descendants of the same people whose land we were given for free but it was it obviously wasn't it wasn't for free and it wasn't empty land and she also really explores into what does healing look like what does rep what do reparations look like what does what do both like lakota and jewish teachings say about forgiveness and how to move forward it's very it's so powerful i can't i've gotten to read it ahead of time and I'm very excited for it to be like out in the world and something that with our, it has a lot of our family is very excited about it but it's also really putting our family on blast it's taking a lot of our specific family's history and story which is really amazing but also very real it's it's not all rosy at all and revealing some of these things that have been like family secrets I would say which are things that were just like oh yeah of course people were alcoholic or of course people were they were people that were experiencing a lot or they were bootlegging and got busted and there was like arrests and things like that which to us were like oh interesting that's like an interesting piece of history but to my grandma for example it's very painful to be putting out into the world but that reckoning around how we have been able to despite our own persecution been able to thrive off of other people's pain and taking from other people like that has to be reckoned with even if it is uncomfortable and recognizing that wasn't even if that wasn't us doing those things we benefited from those things and actually whether or not your family was actively uh, on a homestead plot of land or actively were slave owners for example we all are benefiting from the people that were doing those things and i think like she explores this in the book, but we didn't, our family didn't know what was happening. They were immigrants coming from Russia and didn't understand like politically. What, I mean, most of America didn't understand the extent to what the United States government was doing and how horrific, but that doesn't excuse reckoning with it. It doesn't excuse trying to learn as much as you can and heal from it. And it's been, yeah, it's been like uncomfortable for some of our older relatives for sure, but I've been also super encouraged by the way that our generation and even my parents' generation are really wanting to know this story and really wanting to understand the history. And I think it's really beautiful. And I just think all of us are being called right now to have that reckoning and whatever. And part of it is humanizing because it turns out that nobody, no one anywhere is completely pure. Like I was saying before, humanity's history is that of hurting each other and trying to survive and often surviving by hurting each other. And the more that we can recognize that, the more that we can find ways to not do that, I think. Yeah. Go check out her book. <laughs> wow, okay. That was incredible. I was just like sitting listening. I forgot that I was running this a little bit. That is incredible. Wow, okay. This is a terrible question after that incredible speech but if you could leave all of our listeners with just one message 
what would it be? And you can take a minute to think about it. Just one message. I feel like the thing that's feeling the most present to me is investigating yourself and your family and your life with the desire for truth, but also the desire for compassion. I think that's really where I'm trying to live in general and to be able to hold the ability to hold multiple realities at the same time is the greatest challenge and also the thing that in whatever sector of your life even interpersonally loving someone and being hurt by somebody or being mad at somebody but still loving somebody or being excited about things and also being really overwhelmed by them i think that it doesn't have to be one or the other and i Jewishness, I think, actually teaches us that a lot because just the desire for questioning, continuing to question, and how many answers there can be to one question, I think, primes us to be able to hopefully hold multiple truths at once. Yeah. And art is a great way to explore that. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that encapsulates really well a lot of the themes that you brought to this conversation, just holding two truths at once or holding the dichotomies that exist in our lives and in the world. So thank you for that. It's been so wonderful getting to talk to you and hear all about your lineage and art and practice for the last hour. Yeah, just thank you so much for being here and being willing to talk with us. Of course, we want to know if there's any work you want to highlight. Obviously, want to point people towards all of Aviva's music, which is on Spotify, and new music video for the song Fantasy that came out last week, which is on YouTube. You can also find it linked in our bio, but I'll also link it in the podcast description, so you can get it there too. Aviva's Cousin's book, which we'll put in our story, but yeah, anything else that you want to point people towards of yours. Yeah, my next EP is coming out in July, which is, we'll have the last two singles, Fantasy and Homeostasis. Both of those will be on it and three more songs. And then I have an EP release show at Come On Everybody on July 26th. But yeah, definitely that music video that we just put out is such like a love, just a piece of love of like my whole queer community. It was super fun to make and I feel like really shows the love of the community through it. And then also just on the not music thing, but just from my like, actual work side of things. It's funny that the siren is happening now because <laughs> a lot of the work that I do is with the civil rights division of the Department of Justice, which I'm not speaking in my professional capacity here. I have to say that every time that I'm speaking, not in my professional capacity. But a couple of sites that I've worked on that I think are great resources for people that might not know that they exist. Civilrights.justice.gov is where you can go to submit a civil rights complaint to the Department of Justice. It also has information about different kinds of civil rights complaints and examples of things that are civil rights uh, violations. That is like a really user-friendly and, and expanding place to try and seek justice there. And also ADA.gov is the Americans with Disabilities Act website, which talks all about your rights as a person with disabilities. And yeah, those are just two of the two of the main things that I work on in that capacity of my life that are also just really great resources and things that I want people to know about. Those are super appreciated and important. Thanks for bringing them into the space. We can definitely also link those in the bio, the podcast description. Yeah. Thanks for being with us again, Aviva. This was so great. Make sure everyone to check out everything we mentioned or just go to Aviva's profile, which we'll also have in the description. And you can also find most of all of that wonderful stuff there. And stay tuned for next week when we talk to Zay, who is a Black trans mask designer, punk rapper, and model based in New York City. We're super excited for that conversation. And we can't wait to see you all again next week. Thanks for being with us, Aviva. Thank you so much for creating this space. It's really so valuable and like wonderful. And the episodes that I've listened to have been, I feel like there's a lot of things that I would have wanted to say and I'm like, oh my God, they're already saying it. I love it. (laughs) I want to get all 
Yay. all the people in a room will hang out. Yeah. Yeah. So Literally, we have to do like a party at the end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you both okay. so much. Of course. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Bye.